this historical timeline is going to talk about the Lincoln plots. Now, everyone knows about the plot that killed Lincoln. Most people don't know about the plots that didn't kill Lincoln. You would think this would be cut and dry as to who and why people would want to kill Lincoln. But the who might just shock you. To start off, we have to roll back to 1849. We could go back further, but this is a good starting point. In 1849, the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner was formed, also known as the OSSB. This group was formed as a result of massive Catholic migration during the period. You might be scratching your head, but let me lay it out for you. So there had been an anti-Catholic sentiment on paper as far back as 1642. Yes, 1642, when they founded Jamestown, they had to codify and say they would not allow any Catholic settlers because they were afraid of persecution from the Catholic Church. This wasn't an isolated event. It continued on in the colonies of Virginia and Massachusetts, to name a few. The Catholic Church had been killing people for their religious views since the 1100s under various inquisitions. Protestants didn't emerge until 1517. This was immediately followed by the Jesuits forming in 1540 specifically to be a counter to the Protestant movement. Protestants were protesting that the Pope was the Antichrist and the Catholic Church was mentioned directly in Revelation. So to recapsulate all of that, the Catholic Church had been persecuting Christians for their beliefs, and they wanted to make sure that when they came over to America, Catholics would not be in their colonies, which is why the Maryland colony was formed. It was sort of a religious FUBU colony. But at this particular period, in the mid-1800s, people were noticing a large amount of Catholics migrating to America. The Order of the Star-Spangled Banner was there to raise awareness and keep the Catholics from saturating the population and changing the vote. The Order of the Star-Spangled Banner would morph into the American Party, which Greeley would refer to as know-nothings because when they were asked about their party, they would say that they knew nothing. This is the general sentiment in America at the time, and it wasn't new, it wasn't a whim, it was something that had been going on for a while and was just there. Next, we have 1850, a guy named Pinkerton meets with Edward Rucker in a Masonic lodge to start a private security agency. They didn't start just any security agency. They were going to start a security agency for the protection of the rail system. At this time, the railroads controlled a majority of the money. So if you were connected, like maybe through a Masonic lodge, you had connections, and if you started a business that supported the railway, then you could make a lot of money off of the railroad. July 9th, 1850, President Taylor dies from intestinal issues. We could also read this is assassinated by poison. The next president is Fillmore. He takes over and immediately signs the Compromise of 1850. Now, Taylor dies conveniently as this was about to come, and he was a hardliner and he wanted to preserve the Union. Fillmore rolled over and signed the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850 was the setup for the Civil War. Taylor w wouldn't have had this issue because he said if anyone rebelled against the Union, he would hang them with less reluctance than he hanged people that deserted and or were spies in the Mexico-American War. So in order to create dissension in America, Taylor had to be removed because he would have stamped out whatever rose up as soon as it rose up instead of dragging it on for multiple years. The Compromise of 1850 had a lot going on, and basically what it did was it extended out and pushed back the Civil War by not resolving the actual issues and just putting a band-aid on it. July 4th, 1854, the Knights of the Golden Circle are formed by George Bickley. Now, the Knights of the Golden Circle are established around this idea of a golden circle. The golden circle is the land around the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. So the lower part of the U.S., Mexico, Central America, the top part of South America, and then the islands of the Caribbean. 
this golden circle was going to be useful for the KGC because they wanted to establish a economic empire that was based on the economic model of slavery. If you know anything about geography, you will know that a lot of the landmass that I mentioned in that circle is not a part of the US. In the KGC's mind, they knew all this, but in their mind it was not yet a part of the US. The 1800s were a hot mess of taking over places and an upcoming timeline will be about those events because they are super interesting and not really covered in your average history class or podcast. In 1855, Pinkerton creates the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Remember back in 1850, he met to start one. And then in 1855, he actually started his own rebranded service for the railroad. So for the gamers out there, yes, this is the Pinkerton private detective agency that is mentioned in the Red Dead Redemption 2 video game. And also, this detective agency will start the Union Intelligence Service and create the precursor to the FBI's criminal record database and the Secret Service, the idea of protecting the president. Remember, this podcast is about the Lincoln plots, which were assassination attempts on Lincoln. And up until this point, there was no Secret Service to protect him. Sometimes Lincoln was running around by himself. Also in 1855, a priest named Charles Chinnicky is sued by a wealthy Catholic layman. By this time, Lincoln was a very well-established railroad lawyer, so he wasn't some backwoods lawyer who didn't know the law. He was similar to a lawyer that works for a very large company today. So think like your Google lawyers, your Apple lawyers. He'd be on that level. Remember, railroads were the big business in this period of time. Chinnicky was sued in order to discredit him because he was starting to speak out against the Catholic Church. And because of that, no one wanted to represent him because no one wanted to stand up against the church. Lincoln sees this as a national stage to launch himself into politics. However, Chinnicky does become a confidant of Lincoln in the following years. 1856, Pinkerton hires the first female private detective named Kate Warren. March 6, 1857, the Dred Scott case decision is handed down as the law of the land by a Catholic chief justice named Taney. Taney routinely lied in his decision in order to set forth a precedent that did not exist in the U.S. This is the same precedent that is regurgitated by the New York Times in their 1619 project. I'm not going to get into the 1619 project. You can search it and look it up and see what it's all about. Now, this is the same New York Times that ignored the Holocaust in Germany under Hitler and lied about the millions murdered in Russia under Stalin. October 17th, 1859, John Brown raids Harper's Ferry. January 21st, 1860, Samuel Felton, he is the owner of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. He was worried that his rail line would be vulnerable if something like Harper's Ferry happened again. Harper's Ferry was a plan by John Brown to raid a U.S. arms depot and start a slave uprising that would hopefully spread throughout the entire South. Instead, it failed miserably and did involve a train in the area. Felton was worried about this, so he wanted to make sure that his trains were secure because without his trains, he wasn't making money. Felton would hire the Pinkerton Detective Agency to do the work. At some point in 1860, Pinkerton uncovers a plot to assassinate Lincoln as opposed to attack the rail line. The plot was going to happen in Baltimore, Maryland at the Calvert Station, now remember, Maryland was initially a Catholic colony, so it was a heavy area for Catholic activity. The plot was masterminded by a Catholic Italian hairdresser named Cipriano Ferrandini. The plan was to stage a distraction, and when the police went to go take care of it, because Lincoln didn't have an actual detail guarding him, as the police went to take care of the distraction, then people would come up, stab, shoot, and then grenade Lincoln to make sure he was dead. 
Pinkerton had a detective on the inside where he found out that there were going to be around eight people who were going to try to kill Lincoln, but none of them knew the other person was trying to kill Lincoln as well. So it was sort of a fail-safe. If one didn't do it, the next one did, and they had eight different uh, avenues of approach that were completely independent from each other. November 6, 1860, Lincoln is elected the 16th president of the U.S. He won the race because he carried the North, and there were three pro-slavery candidates that were fighting against each other, splitting the Southern vote. When he wins, this further divides the country and sets us up for the Civil War. December 20th, 1860, South Carolina becomes the first state to leave the Union. February 21st, 1861, Pinkerton intercepts Lincoln and tells him about the plot he uncovered. Pinkerton urged Lincoln to leave immediately to thwart the plan based on Lincoln's published itinerary. February 22, 1861, Pinkerton escorted Lincoln on a clandestine trip through Baltimore, Maryland, from Pennsylvania to Washington, D.C., because of a possible assassination attempt. Warren, mentioned earlier, accompanied the group for part of the journey to play the sister of a disguised Lincoln. She would break off from the group and keep an eye on Baltimore activity. Lincoln would later tell Chinnakee, who would include in his book, Fifty Years in the Church of Rome, I am so glad to meet you again. You see that your friends, the Jesuits, have not yet killed me, but they would have surely done it when I passed through their most devoted city, Baltimore, had I not passed by incognito a few hours before they expected me. Lincoln, even at this point, four years before his actual assassination, knew exactly who was out to kill him. A few days later, Lincoln gives a speech at his inauguration his first inauguration. At the inauguration, Horace Greeley says, I sat just behind him, expecting to hear its delivery arrested by the crack of a rifle aimed at his heart. But it pleased God to postpone the deed. Though there was 40 times the reason for shooting him in 1860 that there was in 1865, and at least 40 times as many intent on killing him or having him killed. No shot was fired, however, for his hour had not yet come. This is the same Greeley that came up with the term know-nothings for the American party. He was completely aware of the Catholic situation, and in his quote, he is referencing that along with the pro-slavery sentiment. April 18th, 1861, Lincoln is made aware of the Knights of the Golden Circle in a letter. September 2nd, 1862, Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation, shifting the historical narrative of the Civil War from a state's rights issue to the Trojan horse of human rights. Human rights sounds like a good thing, but it is used as a wedge for entities to take power through history. In history, always pay close attention when an entity cites human rights as a justification for taking action against another entity. Those rights are never upheld. The proclamation, though, keeps Britain out of the war. Britain would have sided with the Confederate States of America. This also gives Union 200,000 black soldiers over the course of the war, and it hurts the economic power of the Confederacy. So the Emancipation Proclamation was not about freeing the slaves. It was about crippling the Confederates. How do I know that? Because it only freed the slaves in the Confederate states. By 1862, shortages began to kick in. From the author of Why the Confederacy Lost, the experiences of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Then shortages kicked in. In an average year before the war, 800,000 to 1 million bushels of wheat were shipped into Richmond. In 1862, even though the city's population had doubled, and on top of that you had the army ranging in between 70 and 80,000 men, only 250,000 to 300,000 bushels of wheat arrived. By mid-January 1863, the army supply of cattle had dwindled down to enough to last through the end of the month only, and those that they had had become skinny as a result of the winter. Regarding the other meat, pork, the standard joke in the army was that the bacon, quote, outranks General Lee, unquote. In late April and early May 1863, rations for a single day had to be stretched out over three. 
By early January 1864, Davis admitted that the Army issued one quarter of a pound of meat per man per day, and Lee only had one more day's issue on hand. Can you imagine trying to run an army when you only have food enough for the next day? It's incredible. When the Yankees quipped that the Confederates had a new general, General Starvation, they weren't very far off the mark. That was supposed to be funny. You guys got to <laughs> lighten up here, people. I know this is a tough subject for many of you Southerners, but this, you got to lighten up here. With shortages, soldiers took matters into their own hands. On the march or in camp, troops regularly purchased and then later on swiped food from locals. By late 1863, though, there was nothing left to swipe. Instead, they turned on their government. As an Alabama private asserted, hunger will drive a man to anything you may depend. The Confederate government admitted that in 1863 alone, 617,000 pounds of bacon alone were stolen. The commissary of subsistence in January 1864 confessed, quote, every shipment of meat is robbed of from 8 to 1,500 pounds, end quote. To combat the practice, the Confederacy had to place guards on all the trains with orders to shoot people on the spot. Lee tried to solve the food problem as a solution, and get a load of this is quite a revolutionary proposal. Lee suggested an alteration of priorities and civilian consumption habits. Soldiers in the field should become the nation's top priority. Quote, if it requires all the meat in the country to support the army, it should be had, and I believe this could be accomplished by not only showing its necessity, but that all equally contributed. If the government could convince the public to consume foodstuffs that, quote, cannot be so well used by the troops in the field, end quote, it would save other eatables for his men. That's pretty revolutionary, calling for a change in consumption practices. I wanted you to hear that to show that the war was turning already. So the Union strategy was to outlast the South, and they could do that because the South was counting on help from Europe. But in a power move from Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation kept Britain out of the war. March 3, 1863, the Union started a draft. The basic idea of the draft was serve, provide a substitute, or pay $300. March 9th, 1863, 300 Knights of the Golden Circle marched on Reading, Pennsylvania to free their leaders who had been arrested two days before. The Knights of the Golden Circle are a group you almost never hear about, but they were very active in this time period. And their goals of establishing an empire were not illegitimate at the time. July 1st, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg, this is one of the proposed turning points of the Civil War. I'm not here to argue its significance, but I just want to let you know this is the time period that's going on as we move through history. July 13th, 1863, draft riots started in New York. 120 people died during the riots. September 19th, 1863, the Gettysburg Address is issued by Lincoln. 1864, Samuel Mudd, you'll hear his name later, he is a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. He is introduced to John Wilkes Booth with a letter from the Confederate Secret Service who has been stationed in Montreal, Canada. November 15th, 1864, Sherman conducts his march to the sea. General Sherman, he was a Mason and he was raised Catholic, destroys everything for 300 miles in a 60-mile wide path. Sherman's march was the definition of total war. Sherman refined his total war strategy during the Seminole War, where he murdered women and children, burned houses and crops, while avoiding fighting warriors during that war. January 18, 1865, John Wilkes Booth, who is also a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle at this point, and a group of young men were going to kidnap Lincoln from Ford's Theater, lower him down from the balcony with a rope, then escape to Confederate territory where they would ransom Lincoln back to the Union in exchange for prisoners. Now, this was significant because Grant was trying to strangle the Confederate states of manpower 
and they were no longer exchanging prisoners after battles. This mission was approved by the Confederate Secret Service, who was based in Canada at the time. The Knights of the Golden Circle had as one of their goals to kidnap Lincoln and ransom him, and Booth was all too willing to carry that out. March 17, 1865, Booth and a group of men stage an ambush to kidnap Lincoln en route to a play of The River Runs Deep. Lincoln never went to the play because he ended up presenting a flag at the National Hotel. What would happen from this is that Booth would retrieve the weapons that had been stashed earlier by other conspirators that were going to be used later on to assassinate Lincoln. April 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. April 11th, 1865, Booth, Harold, and Powell attend a speech by Lincoln. At the speech, Booth supposedly tells Powell to shoot Lincoln right there. Powell was a soldier and a better shot than Booth. Booth supposedly said two phrases, one about this being the last speech that Lincoln will ever make, another one referring to blacks and voting. Personally, these perfectly aligned speeches in history seem to be made up to me, and the one about blacks voting was completely debunked by Holzer. If you want to hear how he debunks it, go to the website, historicaltimelines.blogspot.com, and click on the link, and you can hear him talk about how it was made up. April 14th, 1865. Booth learned that Lincoln would be at Ford's Theater that evening. He sends for Powell, Harold, and Astorot and revealed a new plan to kill Lincoln instead of capture him. Remember, at this point, the war is over, and there is no point to capture him to release prisoners because the war is over. Later that night, Lincoln is shot by John Wilkes Booth with a Derringer at Ford's Theater. And that's the part that most people are aware of. What they weren't aware of was the reason he called in all the other people and gave them the plan was because he wanted to kill more than just Lincoln. So Grant was supposed to be with Lincoln at the play, but Grant's wife and Lincoln's wife didn't like each other, so Grant's wife made up a reason why they couldn't go. So Booth was going to shoot Lincoln and then stab Grant. So that was two people are going to be killed. Meanwhile, the other conspirators were going to attack other people. Let's break it down. So Booth kills Lincoln. He jumps off of the balcony, hurts his leg, cries, sick, simper, tyrannus. He runs out the back, gets on a horse. And at this point, he was supposed to rendezvous at the Surratt house, get more weapons, and make his escape to the south. While that was going on, Astaroth was supposed to go kill Andrew Johnson, who was staying at a hotel. But Astaroth chickens out. He drinks at the bar and then decides not to do it. Also, Powell and Harold went to William Seward's house. He was the Secretary of State. Seward was injured and recovering from a carriage accident. Harold was the guide and Powell was the muscle. Powell forces his way into the house... He stabs Seward's son on his way to Seward. Then he slashes Seward. Seward had his jaw wired shut and still fights him off. But Powell does manage to slash his face, which leaves him scarred for the rest of his life. While Powell was doing all of that, Harold's outside and hears all the commotion. He gets scared and he goes back to the Surratt house, which is the rendezvous point. At the Surratt house, Harold meets up with Booth, who has a broken ankle or leg or some sort of leg injury. Um, They get weapons, and they travel to Samuel Mudd's house. Now, remember, he was introduced, Samuel Mudd was introduced to Booth previously through a letter from the Confederate Secret Service. At Mudd's house, Mudd bandages Booth's ankle. Then, Booth and Harold continue on their escape route. Now, if you have had an ankle injury you know that once your ankle is wrapped properly, you cannot wear your shoe on that ankle. So, in this act, Booth leaves his boot at the mud house. Booth's boot had his initials on it, which helped link the boot to 
Booth. April 17th, 1865, John Surratt Jr., you haven't heard his name before because he's been working in the background, being a courier for the Confederate Secret Service. He was already convicted of spying for the Confederate States previously. However, being totally innocent, he decides he needs to flee to St. Libiore, Canada, where Father Charles Butcher helps him evade capture and then later link up with Confederate agents Tucker and Lee, who help him travel to Britain, where he stays in another Catholic church, eventually ending up in the Ninth Company of the Pontifical Zouaves. Now, the Zouaves are papal guards, the papal states, currently fighting in a war with Italy, and Surratt decides to fight in that army, showing his true allegiance. Also on that day, Spangler, Arnold, O'Loughlin, Powell, and Mary Surratt, this is John's mother. Now, if you remember, Powell was the one attacking Seward with Harold. Harold left because he got scared. Powell didn't know his way back. He finally made his way back to the Surratt house at the same time when soldiers were interviewing Mary to figure out what was going on about the assassination because people knew some things, but they didn't know exactly what was happening. So they were searching the Surratt house. And as they were doing that, Powell walks up and says, oh, I'm just here to dig a ditch. And it was the middle of the night. But she said she didn't know who he was. They ended up taking them both to jail. April 20th, 1865, Astaroth and Mudd are arrested at separate locations. April 26, 1865, Booth and Harold were finally tracked to a barn in the country. Once the barn house was surrounded, Harold surrendered. Booth would die by a gunshot. May 5th, 1865, Davis, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederate States, dissolves the Confederate government. Davis planned to ultimately go to Texas to continue his fight and hopefully establish the Golden Circle, but... He was captured. July 7th, 1865, Mary Surratt becomes the first woman to be given the death penalty by the federal government. Yay for equality. Mary, Powell, Harold, Astaroth were all executed by hanging. Michael O'Loughlin, Samuel Mudd, Samuel Arnold, and Edmund Spangler were given prison sentences. In the trial, it was discovered that all the conspirators were Catholic and the conspiracy was a Catholic conspiracy. December 6th, 1865, slavery is abolished when the 13th Amendment is ratified. At some point in 1866, Pope Pius IX sends Jefferson Davis, who was in prison at Fortress Monroe, a picture of himself with a handwritten note on it that says some stuff in Latin. The Pope was the only European power to recognize the Confederate states during the Civil War. April 1866, John Surratt Jr., who was in Italy at this time, tells a childhood friend who was there also that he was running from the law because he tried to assassinate Lincoln. That person tells the current ambassador to the Papal States, Rufus King. King then works on getting Surratt taken into custody. November 6, 1866, Surratt is finally arrested, but he conveniently escapes papal authorities. 1867, John Surratt Jr., who was a confirmed Confederate spy and also a defector to a foreign power, the Papal States, stood trial after being caught by King in Egypt. Surratt was found to be not guilty somehow. August 17th, 1867, U.S. Congress voted to cut diplomatic ties with the Papal States. Mexico also severed its ties with the Papal States. September 20th, 1870, the Papal States have its land removed and it was no longer recognized by a state, yet the Pope continued on. Italy was reunified and the Papal States were dissolved into the Italian government. December 6th, 1870, John Surratt Jr. admitted to his involvement in the kidnapping plot of Lincoln in a speech he gave in Maryland. You can read the speech on the website. February 11th, 1929, the Vatican City is created under the Lateran Treaty by Mussolini with a very large reparation payment to the Pope. April 9th, 1984, diplomatic ties remained severed officially for 117 years until Ronald Reagan reestablishes them with the Pope.
November 9th, 1989, the Berlin Wall falls, and later on, that fall is attributed to John Paul II by Bill Clinton. Forget our responsibilities. We honor you for helping to lead a revolution of values and spirit in Central Europe and the former Soviet Union, freeing millions to live by conscience, not coercion, and freeing all of us from the constant fear of nuclear war. With all this, what we have is an undeniable conspiracy, a conspiracy that was fostered by two foreign powers, and we have a severing of ties with one of those powers. The other, the Confederate States of America, were dissolved. Were you aware that the Pope brought down the USSR? Why is a religious seat of power making governments rise and fall? Historically, the papacy was the crowner of kings in Europe. That's what they did. They established power. They would also depose power. So this is nothing new. This is what the Vatican does, or the papacy historically has done. To say that it is a crazy idea the Vatican would be involved with controlling powers in the world is just ignorance of history. It's what they've been doing since they've existed. If you think about it, the Vatican flag has the triple crown and the two keys. The triple crown represents heaven, earth, and the underworld. And the two keys represent temporal and spiritual power that they hold. The only person who can grant power on this earth is the Vatican, according to them. This continues on today, March of 2020, an Ayatollah in Iran is appealing to the Pope to get U.S. sanctions lifted on Iran because of COVID-19. Why would an Ayatollah in Iran look to the Pope to get help with the U.S.? What power does a Pope have over the U.S.?